Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door, and I'm here in far southwest Virginia on a bright sunny day. You can see me squinting into the camera. It's late July, and I'm here in this beautiful meadow. Queen Anne's Lace and chicory blooming behind me. I just did an episode on chicory, and I wanted to follow it up with an episode on Queen Anne's Lace, which is often found growing with chicory, and between them, the whites and the blues make just a fantastically beautiful meadow scene. This episode, I want you to learn everything you need to know about Queen Anne's Lace, so stay tuned. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're gonna find. The first thing you need to know about Queen Anne's Lace, and that is, it looks very similar to poison hemlock, and poison hemlock is deadly poisonous. You need to distinguish between the two, and if you can't, leave them both alone. Both of them have very similar flowers. The Queen Anne's lace tends to be tighter on the top and very flat, while poison hemlock has a more open, rounded set of white flowers. Queen Anne's lace has a hairy stem, while poison hemlock has a smooth stem, and when it's larger, you can see very distinctive purple blotches on it. Queen Anne's lace has finely divided hairy leaves versus hemlock, which has finely divided but smooth and glossy leaves. Queen Anne's lace tends to be only three feet tall, while poison hemlock can be as much as 10 feet tall. If you break the stem, you'll find that Queen Anne's lace has a very carroty smell, like our vegetable, the carrot, and poison hemlock has kind of a musty, foul sort of smell to it. All parts of Queen Anne's lace is edible, but poison hemlock is very, very toxic, and if ingested, can actually kill a human within two hours. It is super toxic. I can't emphasize that enough. Some people often will get contact dermatitis just by touching poison hemlock. If you're not sure of the identity, don't touch them. It's simply not worth taking a chance with it. The second thing you should know about Queen Anne's lace is its relationship to our grocery store carrot. The species is Daucus carota, and our garden carrot that we love to eat comes from a variant of or the original Queen Anne's lace. The Queen Anne's lace that we see growing in the wild is a result of plants that settlers brought as seeds for their herbal and medicinal gardens. The cultivated orange carrots we have now are actually the same species and uh, probably a particular variant possibly defined now as a subspecies by taxonomists. Both Queen Anne's lace and carrot are biannuals. They take two years to complete their life cycle. As biannuals, in the first year, they'll produce a rosette of leaves and a taproot. And photosynthesis of that first year produces starches, which are stored in that taproot. In the second year, they grow taller and will produce flowers and seeds. So with both Queen Anne's lace and carrots, the roots are collected in the first year to be eaten. The Queen Anne's lace root like a wild carrot root, is edible, but does need to be collected early. If you take Queen Anne's lace roots from the second year, you'll find them very hard and woody and not with very much taste. The third thing you should know about Queen Anne's lace is how it gets its name, and it's a very, very interesting story. According to legend, Queen Anne's lace is named after Queen Anne of England, likely Queen Anne II, who reigned in 1665 to 1714. And she was known for her lace-making skills. The flowers, their intricate beauty was compared to lace, and it was named after Queen Anne. Some legends also refer to a contest where Queen Anne challenged her ladies-in-waiting to create lace as beautiful as this flower, though none were able to match the beauty of the flower. Another part of this legend refers to a un very unusual feature of the flower, and that some of these florets will have a very dark purple flower 
right at the center. Some, but not all of the flowers, have this dark purple flower in the center. And this flower has been subject of fascination for centuries. Legends tied to Queen Anne's lace often further in an explanation for the occurrence of this flower. Legend says that Queen Anne pricked her finger sewing lace and a drop of blood fell onto the lace. And the purple flower is the result of that incident. So we've discussed the legend of this purple flower. What does science say about the existence of this purple flower? Why is it there? What would be its biological function? How did it evolve? What does this flower really do? Why is it there? The function or purpose of this flower has been discussed since Darwin suggested it may be a vestigial organ. And a vestigial organ is a structure that has no a benefit to a plant or animal today and was probably of some use somewhere in its evolutionary past. So some scientists today theorize that the dark flower suggests the presence of an insect, perhaps a wasp or bee, and it helps discourage herbivory as the plant-eating organism would not want to bite into the flower if there is a wasp or a bee or insect on it. Other scientists suggest that it appears to be an insect and its function is to attract pollinators. And other pollinators will interpret this as there must be a good supply of nectar or pollen there and I need to get it before that organism gets it. So it seems to attract pollinators. It may also suggest by seeing a pollinator there that there may be some safety in coming to that flower. One study suggested that an increased number of purple florets led to a significant increase in pollinators attracted to that flower. Then they actually tested this with a very clever experiment where they quantitatively added artificial dark florets to Queen Anne's lace flowers and observed the number of pollinators that came to it over time. The fourth thing I want you to know about Queen Anne's lace is how that flower changes over time. And it's very fun and interesting to watch it in a meadow close to you. As the flower develops and becomes the familiar white lacy flat top flower, and after it's been pollinated, it goes through some dramatic developmental changes. Everything seems to start to turn inwards, and at first it creates a kind of concave bowl. And the bowl is in the shape of a bird's nest, and hence another common name of Queen Anne's lace is bird's nest. The entire density of the floret seems to increase as spiny, bristly seeds develop. And this whole seed head can break off and detach and can spread seeds just like tumbleweed. So some of these seeds may be distributed by the wind and others act as hitchhikers. So those bristly, uh, incurved, sharp, pointed things on those seeds can grab onto the fur of an animal and be carried to new places. The fifth thing I want you to know about Queen Anne's lace is its many uses. It was used for food and medicinally in herb gardens all over the world for centuries. So all parts of Queen Anne's lace are edible, but some sources, and this seems a contradiction, say that some people can get skin irritations or contact dermatitis from handling the leaves. So uh, a word of caution there. The plant itself is rich in vitamin A, beta carotene, and many different minerals such as calcium and potassium. I read that these uh, flower heads can be dipped in batter and fried and are delicious to eat. But then I thought, what isn't delicious when batter dipped and deep fried, right? Queen Anne's lace has been touted by herbalists for everything from insect repellents to diuretics to relieving gas and kidney stones. And one of its most interesting uses is as a contraceptive or as functioning like a morning after pill. So anyone that's pregnant or wants to be pregnant should probably stay away from Queen Anne's lace as a precaution. Its contraceptive value has never been proven scientifically, so a big word of caution there. But it's also been very interesting that in the Appalachian Mountains, the peoples have used this for that purpose. 
So my big disclaimer here, of course, is I'm not a doctor. I'm not a practicing herbalist. All I'm doing is reporting things that I've learned about this plant that I read in the literature. So never use any of these herbal plants. None of them have really been uh, tested for safety. Do your research before eating or doing anything uh, with uh, consumption of native plants. So this amazingly beautiful flower and we, especially with this backdrop of chicory, which it often grows with, is non-native. And chicory is non-native too. So what looks like a very normal part of our ecology is actually an invasive species. In fact, in 35 states, it is designated as an invasive species. In other places, however, it's considered to be naturalized, a species that kind of fits in with the local ecology without really disrupting it. And I just love this plant. I love these fields at this time of the year. It's so beautiful to see Queen Anne's lace and chicory blooming together. But I have to remind myself as a scientist, as an ecologist, that these are actually non-native species. But it does appear they're here to stay. Queen Anne's lace uh, is particularly invasive in uh, disturbed areas, particularly where native grasslands or prairie plants are trying to recover. They're fast growing, they're bigger than the natives, they produce lots of seeds, and they are uh, worst in terms of being invasive in disturbed recovering areas. Another point of concern is that they often take advantage after fires. So here again is a beautiful uh, species that we see all around us, naturalized in some places, invasive in others. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode on Queen Anne's Lace, and I hope you'll also check out my playlist on wildflowers and recent videos I've done on great mullein, on chicory, and on milkweed plants that are all part of local meadow communities. Remember, if you like what I do on this channel, please subscribe, give me a like, and leave me a comment. I love hearing from my viewers. And remember, I cover all things nature, from frogs, toads, snakes, turtles, the myriapoda, insects, trees, wildflowers, and fungi. I cover all the things you might encounter just outside your door. Thanks again for watching this episode of Nature at Your Door.